And um, let's get the show on the road. So I want to welcome everyone today to turning active code enforcement into a powerful economic development tool. And I'm super excited to have Matt Widener. Um, and, and I came across Matt because a friend of mine um, who works for a completely different company met Matt and said, Steve, you have got to talk to this guy. Um, he's really an evangelist. Um, for the things that you're trying to take on with Comcate um, through the municipalities that you're serving. And I have to say it was 100% right. And with that, uh, we'll get rolling here. And a little bit of housekeeping before we get too far down the road. Um, you found the chat, so that's fantastic. Um, this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available within 48 hours, if not sooner. I'll also make the slide deck available as well. Um, any of um, the chat log that we have today, and I totally encourage you um, to chat with each other inside of the, um, the chat today. I'll also be keeping an eye toward it. So if you have questions along the way, you can post them there. If for some reason I don't get to your question um, during the course of the webinar, I'll be sure to follow up uh, with a response after the fact. So questions and comments are absolutely welcome along the way. And uh, any of the polls we take today or any of the surveys, um, I'll also make available uh, post um, webinar as well, because they may be interesting to other members of your team. And um, with that, uh, the agenda of what we're going to cover today is um, we're going to talk about the drain of abandoned properties on municipalities um, and, and kind of more of the true cost of what's going on. Um, and we're going to look at active enforcement uh, to the rescue about how that can help, consequences of being passive. Um, positive press um, that you actually get from being active in code enforcement, um, what a clouded title is and why it matters to you, um, the root causes of all these problems of, of abandoned properties um, and vacant lots, how code can help. And we're also going to show you um, just a quick five minute demo of Comkate and how it addresses um, the topics that Matt's bringing up today to show you how modern software can really help out with these challenges. And uh, then we'll wrap up and we'll have a quick survey at the end. And with that, I'm going to uh, go ahead and um, introduce our panelists today. So we have Matt with us and uh, Matt Widener is a Florida-based consumer property rights in title attorney um, practicing down there in St. Petersburg. And you've been at it for what, 20 years now, Matt, 22? 20 plus, yeah. 20 plus years, yep. And myself, and I'm the director of marketing for Comkate, um, Colton Keeney, uh, and I'm also going to introduce him because he's the one who's going to be doing our uh, demo later today. Colton just had a baby, literally um, uh, 10 minutes ago. So congratulations to Colton. Yay. He wishes he could be here today presenting live, but he did a, uh, he's putting in value video today. So super excited for Colton um, and, and baby James. It was a boy. So uh, Matt, I'll, I'll let you take it away here and, and talk about these articles and a little bit about your approach to our topic today. All right, so deep breath that I take in here and, and start to get to work. Um, I, I really love doing these things, and I think that there's just two things that we share in common as we start off here. Number one, we're, we're tired of Zoom calls and presentations where we really don't take anything out of. So my first goal here is I want to make sure in the next hour we make this powerful and positive for everybody that you take something away uh, that's real valuable for you. And then, and then the second thing is that we share. I, I know we all living in communities where we got some vacant lots, abandoned buildings, and we're frustrated by them. Well, at the end of the hour, you're going to have the tools you need to finally do something about it. I, I start off by introducing myself and letting you know that my background is in defending consumers, protecting the property rights of individuals. And that's so important because when you're mayor, council member, code enforcement director, I want you to think about your work from the way that I do, protecting the rights of individuals, when you start from that perspective, um, it, it helps to govern and helps to provide the consistency of your whole program. So you can click back there, get a feel for who I am and the kind of things we're talking about here. But the bottom line is this. Um, what I want you focused on over the next uh, hour here is a list of properties in your community that every one of you can kind of conjure up in your head as you've been driving around. I want you to think about those vacant lots, those uh, burned out, uh, abandoned buildings. Hopefully most of you have demolished the dangerous ones, but to the extent that you haven't even done that, um, let's focus on the, the vacant blighted lots. If you're in code enforcement, they're the ones that you drive past every day and you have for months and you can't do anything about it. If you're the mayor or council member, uh, these are the lots that your constituents are calling you about. You're saying, mayor, why can't you do anything about that vacant lot? Well, here's the bottom line. When you think about your list of 10, and frankly, many communities, a lot more of that, 
at the end of this hour, you're going to be empowered to finally do something about those 10, those 20, those 30 vacant abandoned lots. Active code enforcement is going to give you the tools you need to absolutely do something about it real powerfully, really quickly. Before so, we move on, Matt, Matt I just I wanted just to, to get, get a, a quick temperature, temperature check here, check here from, the from the folks about how they think abandoned properties are holding back development in their communities. And I'm just going to drop a quick question here into the chat. And um, give your feedback here. How are abandoned properties and vacant lots holding back your community? What are you all seeing? You know, we, we've heard this idea of broken window theory, right, in New York, how they were, um, you know, putting things over the broken windows to try to make the communities look better. I know it's, uh, in retrospect, there's a little bit of um, differing opinions about what kind of uh, impact it actually had. But but what do you all think? And I'm going to call out some people here, Mimi and Ginny. Squatters, uh, Matthew says. Yep, that's definitely a challenge, right? What else is anyone else seeing here? Squatters and drug activity in the neighborhoods. Yeah, that's definitely tough. So we're giving a place for blight to take hold. Holding down property values. Yep, criminal activity. Absentee owners do nothing with their buildings. Focusing on our downtown, collapsing buildings. Big eyesores, especially on the main highway in the city. One family owns the majority of the property. And they're just sitting on it. That's frustrating. Dumping trash. Yeah, legal dumping. Terrible first impression. Anyone looking to move into town? Absolutely. Uh, turning derelict, yep. Lack of development interest, discourages new business. Homeless camps, yeah, drug houses, money. Safety for law enforcement, yeah, that's a really big one. You don't know the situation you're going into. And uh, negative perception of the city, yep. Absentee owners who live in other states, yeah. Lost revenue for the city, right? You need to capture those costs. New businesses, abandoned properties. Yeah, yeah, these are all great ones. All right, Matt, take it away. Everything that you just mentioned there, um, active code enforcement is the answer to every single one of those problems that you mentioned right there. And, you know, we'll just kind of flip to the next screen. You, you kind of click them all off. Um, you know, the broken windows theory and, and this in policing, you apply that in code enforcement. It basically says that, you know, these vacant lots breed vacant lots. They're kind of like a virus. The, the burned out buildings uh, breed more blight. They depress property values. They, they reduce the tax base. Um, here's a, a huge frustration. Um, think about the costs that other taxpayers have to spend in order to take care of these vacant properties. Someone mentioned uh, out-of-state owners. We're gonna get to that in detail. Um, but again, we're dealing with owners that have walked away. And let's be clear about what code enforcement is. Code enforcement is forcing owners to comply with the basic property standards that exist throughout a community. Well, um, most communities, unfortunately, uh, continue to engage in what I call the passive theory of code enforcement. For those worst properties, the worst offenders, um, we write tickets and then we engage in the file and forget method, which is, you know, after the, the case is closed, we record a lien and then we walk away from it. Well, um, I, I think we all recognize, particularly based on that little informal survey that you talked right there, this frustration is hand wringing up. Darn it, we're tired of this. You know, if I'm the mayor, I'm sick and tired of the phone calls from his constituents about those 10 properties. Or, you know, I, I presented at a city council meeting and, and the council members started raising their hands and they were talking about these horrible houses in their own communities. Well, active code enforcement is the tool that every one of you now have, you're going to be empowered with, to eliminate all of that. And, and what does it mean? Well, basically, you take those liens. Those liens represent debts owed to taxpayers. Those represent violations of your municipal code, violations of law. And you recognize and use them as a tool. And what do you do? Bottom line is you start building houses with them um, or community gardens or uh, dog parks. But you you stop. You make the position that we're no longer are we going to allow these liens to be repetitive, these cases to continue on. Um, Again, I will talk repeatedly about uh, the file and forget uh, method of code enforcement or passive code enforcement. And at this stage in the presentation, I want everyone to focus on um, a real big stick that's out there, a real big sort of warning that needs to be flashing red and white and yellow to everyone, and that's this. Uh, there are groups that are targeting code enforcement departments all around the country. Ironically, they seem to be focused, at least right now, in my backyard. 
But the reality is, if you look at what's happening nationwide, uh, some of these groups are targeting code enforcement departments. And, and what is it that they're targeting? I, I really encourage you, mayor, council members, city attorney, code enforcement directors, click on these links here and, and study the litigation, pop up the complaints, federal court, state court, and pay close attention to what it is they're accusing code enforcement departments of. When you educate yourselves about that, that'll start to, to guide your special procedures that you implement in your city and make sure that you're protected from these kind of things. But the bottom line is this, um, one of the, the key things that is consistent in all the litigation is there are allegations of violation of due process and there are violations that the uh, fines become excessive. Well, if you're keeping good records of how you're communicating with the violator, um, you can largely eliminate the liability associated with notice. And, and let's talk about the wide range that you communicate with them. You know, uh, letters go out, obviously. Some municipal codes say certified mail. Some letters, it's U.S. mail, but some of it's posting at property. Uh, think about one thing, uh, social media. You know, are you communicating with violators via social media to make them aware of violations in the community? Because remember, one of the key complaints is, Hey, I didn't realize that my property was non-compliant. Well, we got all these Facebook messages that code enforcement went on. We got the letters that were mailed, certified mail, and kept back. You got good records of that. And then the bottom line is these allegations that the excessive fines uh, are, are, are oppressive. Well, active code enforcement will keep you out of that trouble because you're managing the files along the way. You're in communication with these people and you're not letting the problems fester. I wanted to share uh, this slide right here next because it's a real dramatic example of a cautionary tale of, of the consequences of passive code enforcement. You know, Steve, I was sitting uh, at my desk uh, the other day and a little uh, alert popped up. I got Google alerts for code enforcement and lo and behold, it was an agenda item from a municipality. And uh, this municipality was reporting to their commission that uh, we have liens out there. And uh, the, the amount was $300 million worth of liens liens that are owed to the taxpayers of this city. And, and I just sort of took a deep breath for a second. I had to go back to the agenda item and look at it and said, are they really saying $300 million? And lo and behold, yes, they were. Digging even deeper, however, the problem was far greater than that. The $300 million worth of liens were just the volume of liens that were on properties where the liens exceeded the value of the property. That didn't count the, the $5,000 lien for mowing the grass or demolishing the property or whatever else. So again, the number's probably much greater. I know it's much greater in this municipality. Um, right. So I see your question there and I'll segue into it, but the bottom line is this. The first important thing that everybody on this presentation needs to do is grab a hold of this metric. Do you know how many liens are owed to the citizens of your community? And I'll sort of turn that over to you a little bit. Yeah, and one of the things that Joseph points out, and I know this has come up in our discussions, Matt, is um, in his community, we can't afford tens of thousands of dollars of cleanup and demolish uh, for each problem property. The liens don't get paid, and then the city owns the property. And it, I think it's what you were talking about, that cycle, right? That kind of uh, viral cycle that uh, Joseph is seeing. And, um, and, and Ginny is talking about the, the challenges of dual jurisdictions in certain areas, kind of also getting in the way of this as well, right? And um, yeah, one, one of the, the polls we're, we're curious to ask here too is how much of a sense of um, that you have of the liens in your community. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, start that poll. While that poll's there, let me just address a couple of those comments. The, the bulldozer thing is one that I really love focusing on. And, and I say this to every municipality, you should not be firing up bulldozers or demolishing properties until you've got a strategy in place to collect the taxpayer money that you spent to do that. And what does that mean? That just means active code enforcement. And, you know, quite frankly, you know, we know we've got this property that is a danger to the community. If the fire department has to rush in there, they're in danger. If it burns up, neighbors are in danger. You know, uh, your cops, police department will say, look, it's a fester of drug activity. Well, Mr. Mayor, council member, you got to do something now. And that something you do is you run a title search on the property. You find out it's owned by Bank of America or, or whatever, Johnny Smith. But you have an affirmative step now and a policy in place that says, hey, we're going to collect this money when we're done. We're going to it's a lien for 10 grand to demolish that thing. And we're coming after the owner of that property. To get that back immediately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to see here. Um, you know, the question is, do you know the value of outstanding municipal liens? So about 32 percent of folks, which is is higher than I thought, said yes, it's something we discuss regularly. 
and about 68% say, no, we don't talk about it that much. And, um, you know, I, I'm going to pick up on that point because I, I see this pattern uh, continued, you know, many departments across the country. Look, code enforcement is evolving. One of the things I, I didn't talk about at the beginning there is just my real passion for code enforcement and, and the good work that these people do. And I really know that they are an, an overlooked and underutilized resource, right? Um, but what's happened over the last years, decades, I suppose, is that the departments haven't been funded properly. And so, so many departments have this uh, gym in a file drawer method of doing code enforcement, right? We got paper in a file drawer, maybe we're real sophisticated, we got an Excel spreadsheet that the paper gets rolled onto, um, but, but we haven't developed the kind of sophisticated systems that are necessary, quite frankly, to, to quantify this number. And ultimately, and we'll get to this in a minute, protect the code enforcement officers, code enforcement director, department, mayor, volunteer people that sit on the code boards, and what this really is, this whole presentation of active code enforcement, is a call to action. If you are using the file drawer in Excel spreadsheet method, your first order of business is to quantify that number. Yeah, yeah, I understand how big the problem is. And, and uh, Rob here says, um, instead of doing liens, he said we actually put them on taxes now. So, um, which is an interesting strategy. And then uh, Troy chimes in and says, is anyone here that recommends software that helps the city manage its liens? Um, I can tell you that with Comkate and Code Enforcement Manager, we can help you keep track of them and, and know how, how big the challenge is there. And then, um, let's see here, and it says, uh, Wesley says we are trying to place on taxes and how would we go about doing that? Um, I don't know if you have any feelings about that, Matt, about how they would uh, be able to transfer that over legally. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. So sort of disclaimer here, I'm state of Florida. This is all specific to state of Florida. Each state is a little bit different, but, but yes, um, some states, and frankly, it can be very municipality, will allow you to take this money, these expenditures, and place them on the tax, and then ultimately would go up for tax sale. But you, mayor, code enforcement department, have to meet with your city attorney and, and decide whether that's actually working quickly enough for you. The problem, I think, with some of those strategies is it languishes for too long. You know, Steve, one of the things I did in preparation for this is I sort of did a survey of nationwide, you know, how does California treat code enforcement in Indiana and in Arizona? And they all have you know, very similar uh, uh, patterns. And, and that is code enforcement, local municipalities are empowered to take active steps. Maybe a little bit different in each one. Some states, some municipalities have um, like a municipal uh, enforcement board, a uh, sort of quasi uh, criminal thing, like a parking ticket. Um, virtually everyone that I've seen has some opportunity to do uh, foreclosure, uh, which is really what I'm talking about here in the state of Florida, but that's the key step because it's the quickest. Gotcha. All right. Well, let's keep rolling on. All right. So um, it alerted you that to sort of the uh, uh, problem, but I want to talk to you about specifically how this uh, thing just sort of exploded in my head many, many years ago. Um, uh, we had a, a leader come in, new leader come in and appointed me as a special magistrate in code enforcement. And I thought, wow, that's, that's exciting. And I wondered where my black robe was as a judge and my gavel and all the formal <laughs> things. Your <that> wig. <laughs> my white wig, right? It, honestly, the, the room looked a little similar to this, right? It was this uh, very formal old city uh, hall. And we went in there and, you know, all of the resources, think about this in your own world, um, of your code enforcement process. Think of all of the staff resources that go into that, right? We got the clerk there, we got secretaries, we got staff, in most places the entire code enforcement department comes in on that day to present his or her case. And you know, as a private guy, private citizen, I'm just thinking about all the, 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 the revenue that's cranking out there, the expenses, right? The salary, the lights are on, the air conditioning's on, and, and it's bothering me because that's my taxpayer dollars. Well, I want you folks to think about that. When, when you're sitting at code board, think about all of the money that goes into that case from Jim driving out there to the initial complaint to Jim going back out there two weeks later and reinspecting, to Jim trying to make contact with you, and then finally we get in front of code board. Well, here I sit at code board and we got, you know, say 20 cases on there. And of course, nobody shows up. That's one of the problems with codes is people just ignore it because you've trained them that you're not going to do anything about it. So why should I show up if I'm Bank of America or frankly, anybody else? But the bottom line is we're going through the day and you know we're certifying liens uh, five hundred dollars for the grass that wasn't mowed uh five thousand dollars because we had to bulldoze the property and at the end of the day i got down to it and you know i'd written fifty thousand dollars 
has been certified as debts that are legally owed to the taxpayer of this community. And I said to staff, I said, so when do we collect that? And they said, huh, what are you talking about? Well, we, we just record the liens and that's where we file and forget it. Well, we had a really bright group of staff there. And one guy in particular that I, that I frankly give all the credit for this. And this is a staff person within code enforcement. Um, I'm, I'm happy to share his name later, but, but he came up and he said, you know, we really should be doing something about this. And, and this guy in particular, James, um, had, had done all the record keeping and he'd started the Excel spreadsheets and he knew where all this stuff was. And he goes, you know, there's something that we need to do about this. And the mayor empowered staff, hey, let's do something about it. And so we started this pilot project, again, that started at the staff level. He's now the director of code enforcement. So the success of the program is all due to, to the work of council and mayor leadership empowering staff to take positive steps. And the bottom line is, and, and it's the city of St. Petersburg. The aha moment was in the city of St. Petersburg. This is where we started active code enforcement 2016. And if you want to know where the model of, of a really working successful longest, it's the city of St. Petersburg. And frankly, when you end this seminar and you say to your city, hey, I want to do it here, all the stuff is online. Google city St. Petersburg code enforcement. Um, that'll share with you all of the um, things you need to know about um, you know, resolving liens, settling cases, how it all operates. And then ultimately this, let's just focus on this. These are various cities that, that I've worked in or these programs exist in. And you'll see how press has come along and, and looked at what we've done, looked at what staff has done and, and reported on it very favorably, very positively. And when you execute this program of active code enforcement in the ways that we're suggesting here, and when you engage the community in the next slide, we talk about how code enforcement is, is a team sport. But when you engage the community, the stakeholders uh, together, you'll see that this becomes a very, very positive thing in your community. And, and you'll just wake up one day and go, gee whiz, why hadn't we done that long ago? So click on these links because it's got the stories there that get into detail. Yes, Steve. Yeah, and I have a question for you too. Thomas points out, he says that you get a judgment from the court, right? It's positive, um, but you still don't have any money, nor do you own the property, yeah. right? So, so how do you cross that chasm from, uh, and maybe we're talking about later, but from getting that positive judgment to actually right. having money in hand or property. Right. This is one thing that, that really, when you talk to your city attorney, you say, hey, I had this seminar, it was a good idea, we wanna talk about it. One of the concepts that we as attorneys understand is at the end of a case, when a judge has ruled for you, entered a code enforcement judgment, special magistrate judgment, divorce judgment, <laughs> the judge has done something, the magistrate has done something, you have an obligation to do something with that judgment. And that something is not just file it, send it off to the recorder's office and forget about it. The something that you have an obligation to do is to put that into a special category and, and then act upon that. You're, you will meet with your city manager, you'll meet with the mayor and you'll decide once liens get up to say $5,000 or whatever, as we'll get to later, if it's, if it's abandoned property and if it's a certain area, Mm -hmm. Once that lien reaches a certain level, once the violator has not responded to that lien, we, code enforcement, are empowered to do something about that. And that something is we're going to file a quiet title or an enforcement or a foreclosure suit to actually collect the money, to get the owner's attention fully and finally. And then ultimately, as we'll see, uh, for the vacant abandoned properties, clear the title so that a new house can be put on there. Gotcha. No, well, thank you for that. I also want to take a quick poll about uh, proactive versus reactive. Um, someone mentioned in the chat that for their code enforcement efforts, they have one part timer. So it's really hard to be proactive in that case. Um, you know, I imagine a lot of what they're doing is reactive. You know, someone's calling in about their um, lawn, you know, their neighbor's grasping too high and that's what they can respond to. So I'm just curious uh, to learn from you today. Um, I'm gonna start a poll here about what percentage of your cases would you say are proactive today? Yeah, this oh, will... oh, yeah, a lot of the communities that, that Comcade starts working with, um, they kind of are mostly on the reactive side of things. And then by using kind of modern software, are they able to free up time to now become proactive and do these things you're talking about? So let's, uh, I feel like we're dialing for dollars, Matt. <laughs> I'm thinking of Dr. Phil, you know, in the, in the reactive approach. Well, how's that working for you? <laughs> if you're a singular code officer, I want you to, or frankly, department, doesn't matter. I want you all to think about how much time you spend on the repetitive cases over and over again. How much staff time are you burning on the phone with somebody that you know isn't gonna solve the problem? Well, once you adopt active code enforcement, you got procedures in place that shut off those useless communications 
and compel immediate action out of the violators so we're not caught in this endless cycle. Yeah, while the poll's going, um, Gina has a question. Uh, she asked, could you please repeat the names of the legal actions to take? You went through, I think, a bunch of foreclosure and... Yes, yeah, so again, uh, I'm specific to Florida, but as I looked around, I, I focused on California. And um, of course, each one of you has to look at your municipal code, but just generally, um, states and uh, just municipalities have like a civil enforcement, a ticket as an example. In Florida, we've got a real problem because homestead are protected from liens. So what some municipalities are doing is, you know, dragging them into a municipal court and slapping them with a, you know, $50 fine because your pool is a danger and some kid's going to die in it. So that's one method. Um, some folks mentioned this idea of, of rolling the costs onto the tax uh, bill. Uh, that's That can work, but it usually takes so long and it really doesn't impose a penalty on the violator. The one that is really important, and this is active code enforcement, is actively enforcing that judgment, that lien right then and there. City of Leadville is, is owed 10 grand for mowing the grass and for bulldozing the property. And Steve, vi the violating property owner, if you don't pay this, uh, we're gonna take your property from you. That's gonna get somebody's attention. Yeah, and, and some, I'm reading through the chats here as we're going and some really excellent dialogue. One of the things that you and I talked about is, um, and maybe it comes up later, but there's kind of two distinct flavors um, of what we're talking about. One are, um, you know, individuals and then corporations, right? And a lot of what we're talking about here today is is with a corporation in mind, right? Investors that kind of abandon properties. And I know one of the things that you talked about with me, Matt, is that um, when it comes to, um, I think it's Gina who mentioned it, you know, what do you do with um, a property owner who who's, who's wants to do good but can't afford to fix up their property? And, and I know you talked about an angel fund uh, yeah. as, as being a way of getting there. Yeah, well, listen, that's, I mean, I'm so glad you brought that up because this, again, focusing on the very positive components of the active de development, um, there is a category of violator out there that doesn't want their house looking like this one that's sitting there, frankly, any of the ones that are there, right? They need assistance from the community. And, and part of what we'll get to later, engaging stakeholders, is taking uh, the, the bad actors that are just flagrantly violating and, and converting some of that money into an angel fund or a way that we can uh, help people that really are deserving of it. And again, this is one of these elements that become so positive because we're able to help people that are stuck in this cycle. And, and one of the things that you'll be cued off to when we talk about best practices is, do you have an off ramp at every step in the process? So if an innocent violator, somebody who doesn't want to be in violation, wants to solve it, you code enforcement department, you mayor, you've got the tools, and a lot of times that means money, to help this innocent violator. You do active code enforcement, you're gonna have that to be able to help those folks. Great. Well, uh, in terms of uh, percentages of cases are proactive, zero to 25% was 33%. Um, 25 to 50% of the cases is 16. 50 to 75 is 24. That's really good representation. 75 to 100% uh, is 9%. That, that's really high. And then um, some folks aren't are really sure right now. And um, one of the things about having a software to help you with this stuff too, is it makes it easy to be able to track um, what's what's proactive and reactive over time, if that's something you're aiming to improve. So let, let's move on. Yeah, so um, let's, let's look at these vacant abandoned houses here. You guys can, can repeat that picture over and over again in, in your head and think about your particular community in your houses. And I, I really want you focused on that for a minute and think about those vacant lots, those abandoned buildings. And as the communication or the chat is going on, these, these frustrated uh, cases that you have, what is it that you think is the primary driver of blight in your community? You know, particularly when you look at those uh, neighborhoods or whole areas, regions where you have this. And this is a, a critical point that I really want to focus on for a minute right here. It is that the title is clouded. The title is junky. And when we go and buy a house, go to a title company, uh, Steve sells the house to Matt, quick claim deed, there's a title insurance policy. That's my proof, my confirmation that I own it free and clear. But in the vast majority of the cases that you folks are thinking about, your 10 worst properties, there's a problem with the title. And, and what is that problem? You know, we got an old Bank of America mortgage. I keep picking on Bank of America because they were, were one of the worst violators long ago, but in any event, you know, we got an old uh, Bank of uh, the Ozarks mortgage on there for 25 grand. It was recorded 50 years ago. Uh, we got IRS liens. We got a uh, lien from Steve in a, judge, a divorce case or something like that. 
And what happens is those liens pile up on a property. And even if I keep picking on you, Steve, even if Steve didn't want to be a violator and he wanted to sell this property and, and, and Matt, the investor, wanted to buy it, I couldn't do anything with it because the, the title is clouded. So one proposition here is that if, if I had a magic wand and I came into your community and I waved that magic wand, poof, and cleared all the title, then you would have this rush of capital flowing into there. Well, the, the, the truth of the matter is you do have the magic wand. Um, the magic wand is active code enforcement because what happens is in all those cases that I mentioned, you know, uh, the heir died uh, years ago. Um, there's mortgages on there. None of those parties that have an interest in the property are going to step up to the plate and do anything about this junky title. There's a reason why they have it. Clearing the title is what uh, you have to do. And frankly, the municipality is the only one to do that. Let me talk about the two main categories of uh, junky title um, that exist in every single community I've ever seen. Um, failure to open estates. That's probably the biggest one. And, and I really encourage you folks, as you're keeping your list of top 10 and just keeping your inventory properties, focus on this one. Does your county recorder uh, indicate for you when the last record ownership is of a, a deceased person? The typical cycle of blight uh, in our communities that show a failure to thrive economically is that you know, grandma and granddad bought this house, uh, 30s, 40s, whatever it is, and they took great care of this beautiful, thriving neighborhood. When grandma and granddad died in the called 60s, 70s or whatever, one of the kids moved in there. The thing they didn't do was they didn't probate the estate from grandma and granddad to bring it down to that next generation. Adult lives in there and then fast forward to you know where we are, 80s, 90s, literally some of these cases, decades. And because they didn't open up the estate, no one clearly owns it. And because no one clearly owns it, Steve, he can't execute the quick claim deed to give it to Bob. Um, so no, no amount of money is going to make it work. And then particularly when you get to this fractional ownership where, you know, five kids, six kids, eight grandkids with mortgages on there, there's just no ownership interest all that, that, that makes sense, financial sense for somebody to do it. So they walk away. Mm -hmm. The second, and, and again, so clearing the estates. And, and the other point is, this is an element, an opening here where a community has just a, a real powerful opportunity to go in there and do good work for an underserved community, a community that's failure to thrive. You go in there as the city, as the mayor, as a council member, and you start transferring these properties into the heirs while collecting the money you've spent. There's a way to do both of that. You're doing a real service to these people, and it's something that um, you know is going to be a benefit. So the, the next one is corporations. Um, you know, again, when you look at your list, you're going to find XYZ LLC bought the thing in, in 2000 and, and didn't do anything with it. Uh, there's some funky trust uh, from wherever, New Mexico or, or some foreign country. Well, what's happened a lot of times is these companies have made these investment decisions and then uh, either they didn't know what they were getting into or the problems become so big that they can't do anything about it. And, um, and they just walk away. So one uh, final element on this slide that I want you to focus on is do your code enforcement procedures contribute to the blight? So let's take a deep breath here and think about that. Um, if, if I'm an estate attorney and I call up the city and I say, hey, I did a title search and I found all these liens for the city on here, do you have in place procedures that will allow me to efficiently and effectively remove those things? A lot of times cities don't. You know, if I'm Corporation X um, and I bought this thing tax deed for five grand or whatever and, and I do a title search and lo and behold, there's 50 grand worth of liens up on there. Do you have a pathway that I can reduce or eliminate those liens? Um, if you don't, then you're part of the problem. What's part of the solution? We might re reduce, we might settle, we might abate contingent on you pulling a, a, a certificate of occupancy. That means build the house. So we're not just going to wipe the liens away. We're not just going to give it away. We're going to compel you to do something positive in the community in exchange for wiping away or eliminating those liens. So, yeah, one, one question we have, Matt, just before we go too much further, Slumlords came up a bunch inside of the chat um, and saying, you know, and maybe the corporations one seems like a little different flavor where they invest in the properties and then just aren't paying attention to them. What would you say for folks that have a lot of slumlords in their community and, you know, they're actually people living in these properties. They're not, they're not vacant. They're not abandoned. They're slumlord properties. They're in terrible shape. Um, but a lot of these issues we're talking about are persistent. Yeah, that's right. Listen, let's think about what our role here is. We have a job to serve the members of the community. And what does that mean? That means those tenants, those members of our community that are living in those houses, we've got an obligation to them 
And particularly when we're finding health safety violations, um, we've got an obligation to get in there and do it. Now, of course, we've got to be really sensitive and, and walk that fine line between making it so oppressive that we're chasing on affordable housing. Um, but again, we're recognizing that obligation. So back to settlement procedures, you know, we're, I don't like the word slumlord, but, but those that are keeping their properties um, uh, below sufficient health and safety codes, we got to look at our procedures and we have to decide whether our settlement procedures are balanced in such a way that we can compel the property owner to make health safety violations cured uh, in such a way that doesn't chase out affordable housing. Um, the, the problem that you will find over and over again, and, and since we're talking about the, those, let's call them persistent violators that ignore uh, the health safety codes. I, what I find in most communities is you've probably trained these uh, persistent violators to continue to engage in persistent violations. How have you trained them to do that? Because you haven't engaged in active enforcement on the worst building, um, you know? So when you have these uh, persistent violators that have multiple properties, you're gonna have to pick off one and you're gonna have to do something about it to make the point. And now here's what happens in, in every single community that active code enforcement has been put to work. The moment you start training them that you are taking this seriously, the moment you start training the persistent violator that the mayor, council, code enforcement department are all working together here to protect the welfare of the citizens, and we're gonna go after that, things start changing immediately. Back to that Dr. Phil thing, how's that working out for you? Once you start actively enforcing, they're going to start coming to you and solving the problem because you've got a real stick to do something about it. So that makes sense. Focus on this. If you don't do it, nobody is. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll take a deep breath here. It looks like we're you know roughly halfway into the middle of this thing. Um, but let's let's talk about action steps. I hope I've made the case that the first thing you need to do is, is focus on your list of top 10, 20, 30, whatever it is. But before you engage in this active code enforcement, um, I, I plead to you this, and that is elevate your code enforcement officers in the department, right? You know, think about the value that, that they serve within your city, hey, Mr. Mayor, council member. If your code enforcement department, you know, you step up, pull your chest high and, and have that meeting with the mayor and, and say that you have a proactive solution to the problems that you are seeing in your committee and community. You know, listen, uh, even code enforcement officers, the people with dirt on their boots, they're down there on the ground really working hard. You know, you watch this seminar and maybe you're the one that brings this to your code enforcement director and says, hey, director, uh, I got a way that we can solve that vacant lot, that burned out house. Oh, really? What do we do? But the, the step before we get started on that is just to make sure your procedures are in place. This is an audit of procedures from top to bottom. This is an engaged conversation between the code enforcement director and officers, city attorney, you know, checking the boxes to make sure we got notices right, we got all our procedures correct. And, and after we've done that, and we're engaged in this really helpful process of evaluating the entire department, we might've gone to, to Jim's file drawer that have all those uh, liens in there just in paper, and we've inventoried them and we've said, look, you know, God forbid something happens to Jim and we don't know the way the process works, We've got them inventoried and online into a system that makes sense. Then down at the bottom there, um, you know, we've, we've developed this inventory of uh, properties that we know deserve our attention and our action. And another element that I would encourage every community to do uh, is kind of a Venn diagram. And that would be, you know, we've got our active cases of code. They're all piled up. And then we've got our vacant property. Listen, folks, uh, those vacant lots, those are your community's greatest resource and asset, right? We're having this historical flight of people all around, you know, out to the suburbs. Maybe they're going back to the cities. I don't know what it is. But there is not a single community in this country that you can't find would say that an inventory of available building lots that were available cheap wouldn't be a spark, a profound spark for uh, single family housing, affordable housing. So and, yeah. and how do we how do we get there? That that last quadrant there, you know. This is a team sport and, and getting everybody together on that is so important. Um, we're doing chat or we're gonna do the next thing, but- Actually, go, go back for one slide. I just okay. wanted to uh, point out some things. So I tapped into uh, Marcus Kellum, who um, is, is a good friend of ours and uh, he's a code enforcement um, professional veteran. Uh, he has a training company now. And I asked him about too, about how do you build that um, inventory of vacant uh, lots um, if you haven't been doing it all the way along. And I thought he had some really great tips. I just wanted to cover off on those before we move on. And he said, you know, 
one thing you can do is enable legislation that defines vacant and abandoned. For example, 60 days, no water, right? Uh, that would be a way to get there. Perform street sweeps and grid inspections uh, within house staff or outsourcing it. Volunteer surveys uh, require property owners to notify the local government when houses become vacant. Uh, and then coordinate with the tax assessor, sanitation, other related departments to try to put together this database of properties that you're talking about. Um, yeah. And so it's, it's multiple tips on the spear. All the above, there's one really critical one that's really interesting. Most cities, uh, when you build a sewer plan or electrical or whatever else, uh, the, the cost for that is bonded of all the lots that are in the city. So one real powerful way that you can target lots is find out how many lots are not hooked up to the sewer system. And then that becomes a way that you can you really powerfully engage. Um, let's be very clear about what we're talking about because the only uh, objection that I can think to why a community wouldn't engage in active code enforcement is that we're not crystal clear about what it is we're talking about. And this Venn diagram here really makes the point and drives it home. We're talking about vacant lots and abandoned buildings, right? Again, your list of 10 or 20 or whatever. Um, large accumulated fines. Those accumulated fines represent my taxpayer dollars that we've spent taking care of somebody else's building. And then finally, non-responsive owners, right? So uh, we're talking about the LLC that we haven't been able to get a hold of. We're talking about heirs that have you know blown to all corners of the earth, so we can't get a hold of anybody there. Uh, we're talking about you know the, the, just the flagrant violator, the one that's been thumbing his nose at the the code enforcement department and frankly the the citizens of his community uh, for many years. You get that Venn diagram right there, and you focus on those particular lots. That's the sweet spot. And and the really interesting thing about this is, particularly mayor, council member, you think about this. That Venn diagram right there uh, is focused in areas that are economically deprived right now. I call it failure to thrive economically, right? But in many cases, frankly, most cases I've looked at, that area is right near the city core, right? That's because of the historical development patterns. You know, the, the city was born in the turn of the century, let's call it. The hospital's here, the, the city hall's here, police department, everywhere's around there. And then in the 70s and 80s, we have this suburban flight. And so the areas right around the city core, they're the ones that are the most blighted. That's where your Venn diagram is. That's where your opportunity to make real and powerful economic change really quickly exists. So, um, you know, we're, we're kind of pulling a circle in here. And uh, I just want to talk about something, Steve, that you and I uh, have talked about. And, and that's just that uh, this is a team sport, right? I think I've, I've made the case powerfully um, of the need for all the departments and the stakeholders to be talking together about this. Um, I'm, I'm so passionate about code enforcement, again, because of what these people do and the opportunity that they have to come into a community and, and really do something powerful. And, and really, you know, hooking up code enforcement with economic development, I just had an experience just yesterday, as a matter of fact, where you know, code for economic development was in these initiatives and they had this federal money and they're doing all this stuff and that they weren't able to engage that project. Well, what I told them was, you find the liens, your code enforcement liens, and that allows you to clear out all that, that vacant and abandoned and blighted stuff around uh, this, this economic development project you want to kind of light bulb went off. Wow. Of course, city, county attorney, both want attorneys involved, right? Make sure that they're part of this. Uh, elected appointed official, you know, whether you're city manager or mayor or whatever it is, you need to understand this tool that you have. You know, these people that work for the city, the salt of the earth kind of people in our code enforcement. I have another sort of uh, thing that's that I really like to talk about, and that is that you know, code enforcement, these folks, these are your real ambassadors in the community. I know we love police department and, and that the cops with the uniform on can go into the department and engage the citizens. Well, think about the opportunity of code enforcement officers to engage, right? These folks, again, with, with dirt on their boots, salt of the earth people that, that have your logo for the city, these folks are your ambassadors. Elevate them, empower them, make them uh, your ambassadors of a positive message that we're going to do something good in the community. And then when you make that full circle all the way around, you see nothing but good things that happen. So um, that's all the general stuff. Let me talk to you very specifically, uh, just grind the point home, very pragmatically and practically how it works in the state of Florida where we've implemented this program. Um, on the left here, you got blight. Your inventory of vacant dirt, abandoned houses. Um, you have decided at the end of this seminar that you're gonna do something about it. So. Code enforcement department, you're tasked with getting that list. Where's our vacant property? Where are the liens that are piled up against these things? Boom. You've met with code enforcement. The manager and department heads are all grinding together. This takes a week or two weeks. We're not talking about two months on this, folks. This is easy stuff, right? 
So your code enforcement department has identified these properties. And you sat down with the mayor, uh, you know, two weeks later and said, mayor, here's the 10. The mayor goes, hey, I got another 10 on here that I just heard about from our constituents. Council members pop in and they go, hey, you forgot about these 10. But the bottom line is we got our inventory of things that, that we're working on. And we've got consensus now in the community. We're going to do something. Community outreach. We reached out to council member in that area. Boom, he's behind it. We've talked to Habitat for Humanity. They're, they're behind it. Um, they're in the city in this country that I've looked at that affordable housing is not a priority. So we've engaged those stakeholders and we've said to Habitat and, and individual infill builders and members of the community, hey, we're going to do something about that. Another really positive and powerful thing about this is adjacent landowner. You know, if that, that, can, that citizen that's been complaining about that vacant lot pile high with mattresses for five years, Hey, Mrs. Smith, we're finally going to do something about that. The thing's going to go up for auction in a month and, and you may get it or community garden, dog park, whatever. Um, point down here, serve owners of record, right? Uh, the, one of the big problems is that we just haven't, through the whole process, gotten a hold of owners. Where the rubber really hits the road, where we start to see results, is when the process server is out there tracking down Steve that's been hiding in his uh, basement up there in Connecticut or wherever, and the process server knocks on the door and hands it to him. Well, that may literally be the first time that Steve's been fully made aware of the magnitude of the problem. But at that stage, we have an opportunity to settle. He's able to pay the fines, make it go away, settle it. That's a good thing. It's only after we finally gotten a hold of him formally that in absentee owners and all that, um, that it goes to the court. And, and finally, the judge says, and I see some comments in there about, hey, what do we do about the absentee owner? I just had one this currently. She's in France, right? So what do we do about the person that lives in France and has an abandoned property that's a danger to the community? Well, uh, every uh, state that I'm aware of has rules. If you own a piece of dirt in the community, I don't care if you live in France or Mozambique or whatever else, we got a way that we can make you take care of the property that's in your community. That's what the legal process is. That's what active uh, process is. So again, only after we've exhausted every opportunity to, to get this uh, property owner that the bottom line is they are failing to respect the code of the city. They're failing to respect their neighbors and the citizens and taking care of it. It goes to auction. And, and the final step of this is, is, again, one of the real sweet spots. The city of Leadville's owed 50 grand for mowing the grass and bulldozing the property and attorney's fees and costs. And um, it goes up to auction now. And third party bidders have the opportunity to pay uh, all those fees and costs are owed back to the community. And, you know, Steve, I, I thought about this. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll tie this up. And then once that title is clear, and this is the way the foreclosure process works in quiet title, that's why this is so powerful. It goes up to auction. All the parties are named. Everybody that had a potential title interest, mortgage, IRS, whatever, they don't want anything to do with it. And so at the end of the process, the end of the foreclosure process, in most cases, is poof, title is clear. Now, whoever bid at auction and paid 10 grand habitat, they own the lot, they got clear title. Um, and then they can build a house on or whatever else. One part that I realized, Steve, in our whole conversation we haven't talked about is um, this should not cost the community anything. And let's focus on this because it's amazing. The first time we did this, I'll never forget, uh, the city council had appropriated some money to go and do this. And, and at the end of our, our first cycle, we went and reported and city council member goes, you mean to tell me not only did you not spend the money that had been appropriated for this, but this actually generated, you know, five times that? They said, yeah, that's the way this works. Uh, it's done on a contingency. All the costs involved in tracking down errors and, and serving and filing the cases are ultimately paid for by the bidders that come on um, at the uh, auction. Mm -hmm. So um, my, my screen cut out somehow, but that's probably good timing. Maybe that's the signal that... Uh, <laughs> 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 Not sure what happened. So I just want to do a, a quick demo for everyone here. Um, all these topics that Matt's been talking about, about being able to um, give notice properly, um, being able to demonstrate that you're evenly applying your uh, code enforcement, um, being able to have logs uh, to be able to demonstrate that you've been reaching out to the um, property owner over and over again. Um, these are all very hard things to do without modern software. If you're doing it with pen and paper and Excel or a tool that wasn't built uh, for the purpose, it can be difficult. So uh, Colton, who I mentioned just had the, his baby, um, recorded just a quick five minute demo of Comcade just to show you all what's possible. And um, go ahead and, and play that for you now. Thank you, Thank for, you allowing for allowing me to join you on this webinar, webinar virtually through recording. recording. 
Steve asked me to give you a demo of Code Enforcement Manager, and in line with what you've heard today, I'm going to show you how you can use Concave to keep better records, give notice properly, and show that SOPs were followed at your agency. I'm going to start today's demo by clicking the Create a Case button and show you how quick and how easy it is to document new Code Enforcement case in Concave. You start, you start by clicking, by clicking the Create Case, case button, button and scrolling to the location bar and adding your address. address. Today I'll be adding 2504 West, West Roman, Roman Avenue. Avenue. When I select, when I select that, that parcel, parcel, the owner's the information owner's... is automatically added to the case. There's a few ways Comkate can work with your agency to get your owner information into Comkate, but generally we're working with someone who has tax roll or assessor data to upload it into Comkate or connect it live, so it's always up to date. Once the address is added to the case, we can move down and make sure that we add the violations to the case next. All of your violations will be preloaded in the Comkate during the implementation period, which for us only takes 45 days. We're very, very nimble and very fast, and we take pride in how quickly we can help agencies get live on our application. Today I'll be adding a weeds violation, followed by a trash violation on the same case. Fully documented. Next, we add the contacts onto our case. Because we've integrated with assessor's data, the owner, whether it's a business or an individual, has already been added to the case, along with their contact information. We can also add other contacts that have been on previous Comkate cases that are available in our Comkate database. In this case, I'll add Mr. John Johnson as the complainant. And I could also add other new contacts if I have never had an interaction with this person before through Comkate. We can also add photos and attachments to this page, if we have any. But for now, I'll skip that step, and I'll go to the top of the page, and I'll click Create Case. Before we finish, we have to schedule an inspection. So I'll choose Schedule Verification Inspection, Schedule Time to Go Out Tomorrow, and assign this to a member of my staff, Elizabeth, and I'll click Create and Schedule Inspection. And that's it. The case has now successfully been created in Comkate in less than a minute. To show you how to perform and log an inspection on a code enforcement case so your record is always up to date. I'm going to scroll down to the right here and click blue perform inspection button. And the first thing I need to do is go on the record and validate that both of these violations are legitimate after I perform my verification inspection. I'll do so here, clicking valid for the weeds and the trash. And if there are any other violations, I can add them from the municipal code and violation library that was uploaded to Comkate during your implementation period. For now, I'll skip that step. Next, I can come down and add an inspection note. This note can be used to describe anything that took place during the inspection that you need to take note of. I can also add photos by clicking the photo icon. I can click browse file and access a quick photo on my computer, or I can click the blue camera button and automatically flip on the camera on my device. After I've uploaded my photos, I can click the blue continue button. And now it's time for me to select what type of notice I'll be issuing. If this is a verbal warning, I can select verbal warning and document that on the case. If I need to issue an actual paper notice of violation, I can choose first notice of violation, add any fines that I'd like to add to the case, update my compliance periods. So if the weeds, for example, are on a 30 day compliance period, but the trash is on 14 days, I can document those separately and track them on the same case and take care of them with the same notice issued to the property owner. Before I complete my inspection, I need to schedule a follow-up inspection date. In this case, I'll do that after seven days. I'll then click continue. And if I have a certified mail number, I can enter that into the case. In this case, I'll skip that step. I can modify my resolution actions that were preloaded up into Comkate during the implementation process. And then I can select who I'd like to issue the letter to. In this case, I'll just be issuing a letter to the property owner, but if I had a property manager or a tenant in the property that I was working with, I could issue multiple letters at once. I then click the blue generate notice button. And here we can see a preloaded template of the actual notice of violation that can be printed and sent out directly to the violator. It's pre-addressed. It's addressed with today's date and also with the Comkate code enforcement case number. Also individual complying dates and descriptions for each of the cited municipal codes and an e-signature for my signature as an officer on the case. I'll then click do not print for today's demo. I'll click issue notice and complete inspection. And that will bring me right back to the code enforcement case details page. And now I can see fully documented that the notice was issued on March 29th, 2021 by officer Keeney. Any notes that Officer Keeney took and the actual copy of the letter itself are accessible directly from the case. In Comkate, you have the ability to look up cases that are very old and see a comprehensive view of every activity that's ever been performed on the case. By clicking the View History button, 
you can see a full log of every action, the date and time it was performed, and a description of what it was performed and by what user. In the expanded view of the case details page, you can also see a comprehensive view of all the abatement activities along with dates that have ever taken place on the case. In this particular example, you can see the case has been created, closed, opened, and reopened many times and many inspections have been completed. All the violations, all of the contacts, and all of the photos that have ever been added to the case, along with notes, are all easily accessible to help you maintain compliance and follow your SOPs at your agency. In some case, you have the ability to filter by cases that have liens on them and also see the outstanding balances due. Here I've added a column that lists outstanding balance and we can see all of the lien cases that have outstanding balances and their overdue amount. I can also add a filter to this case listing page for the outstanding balance. And the outstanding balance filter allows me to choose any dollar increment. In this case, I'll just choose overdue and click apply. I can export this information out of Comcate into Excel sheet and use it as a report in order to use for any court activities that may arise down the road. Comcate also has a robust report section with seven templated dashboards and multiple reports loaded into each of those dashboards. This is available to all of our users. Our philosophy is this data can be used to show that code enforcement is focusing on the right things. In the My Stats Overview page, we can see the total number of cases, the average response time, and also the number of inspections completed and the activities performed. If I click on the banner above the report, I can sort this by start date and end date so I can cut out custom pieces of time, whether it's a quarter or a month or a year, and I can also filter by staff. We try to make the reports easy to use as possible so the code enforcement officers, supervisors, and managers can export data out at the snap of a finger and provide it to the executive team. And with that, we're back. And that brings us to uh, the top of the hour here, Matt. And I hope you enjoyed seeing a little bit about Comcade's Code Enforcement Manager and to see how it kind of dovetails into this conversation today. Um, we covered a lot of ground today for sure. Um, and Matt has a super fertile mind. And um, here's our contact information. So if you have any questions throughout standing today that you'd uh, love to follow up with, our contact information is here as well. And um, at the conclusion of our uh, time together, I'm going to send you to a survey uh, about this webinar. We'd love to have your feedback about what you thought about this topic and what you uh, would like to hear about in the future. And there's some questions rolling in here, Matt. And uh, let's see what we have. So for everybody who would like the presentation, um, I'm absolutely going to send out a copy of the deck um, and uh, Matt's great slides here afterwards, along with a recording of the webinar as well. Uh, a lot of these folks, um, Matt, it's really positive I've been saying they want to share this with their mayor. Um, so just what you said was the uh, the outcome you'd love to see. Um, people are of a like mind with you for sure. Um, someone asked along the line, Doug, if we uh, integrate with ArcGIS, we do. So um, it makes it really easy to be able to plot your um, properties geospatially. And let's see here. Given I do animal control and other duties, does the software have other modules? It sure does. Um, so we have an animal control module that also goes along um, with our tool set as well. And uh, Gina would also like the presentation. Um, great. We have some geo and it works just like this demo. Well, that's great. And Matt, I want to thank you so much for being here and joining us today. Um, it's been fantastic. And we hope to work with you again in the future. Do you have any parting words? Oh, you're muted, I think, Matt. Or your mic's not on. There we go. I'm, I'm just, I'm so thankful that, that you give me this opportunity, Steve. You, the slides and the, the presentation really uh, helped it to shine. And seeing all these comments in here, people actively engaged is, is so encouraging. And, and just the, the one thought that I would leave is that all you need to do is flip the switch from the idea that we're doing all this work and we can't collect it to deciding that we have an obligation to collect it. And the moment you flip that switch, you sit down with your mayor, your city attorney, I promise you there's a pathway that you will be able to collect it. And it's just a matter of, of engaging and starting the process. Great. And thanks for everyone chiming in saying they'd like the presentation. It'll be auto-generated and sent to you for sure. And I'm going to uh, send you to the survey now. Um, please take a minute to fill it out. It really helps us guide us. And, um, and also what topics you want to hear about next. So again, thanks, Matt. Thanks, everyone, for showing up. Thanks for the robust feedback. We loved it. Thank Have you. a great day. Bye.